Well, it is great to be here. I very much appreciate the opportunity to chair this session on uh, on what we is entitled Benefits Barriers, Unintended Consequences, and Potential Facilitators <laughs> Associated with Improved Storage Systems. Now it works. Okay. Um, before we go any further, I would like to say what a pleasure it is to be a part of this, uh, this process, this uh, symposium. Uh, certainly, uh, while I've devoted most of my career towards productivity gains, it's never been uh, far from my mind that ultimately the amount and quality of the product that gets to the consumers is really the, the, main, the main driver, the main indicator of our our success. So this is very timely and it's been something that's that's been on my mind for quite some time. I uh, uh, was re reminded of a time when I started my career in Sub-Saharan Africa, the country of Burundi, and uh, FAO was pushing in 1980 uh, a lot of post-harvest work on how to reduce post-harvest losses. And hear many of the same questions coming out. It's 40 years ago, if my, math, if my math is correct. And I think one of the things we need to be having in the back of our minds is why after 40 years are we still asking the same questions? And we started to touch on that a little bit this morning uh, about what is the real value to farmers of various technologies what, is the, what are the contexts in which those technologies might have value or add value? And uh, something that we have not heard very much about, just around the edges, is what are the advantages, what are the gains to, to the broader society? And I like to think of that in terms of the consumer. And, uh, and, uh, and in addition to that, we need to add the, the environment. So I think that we've, we've, we're starting to pose uh, a number of very good questions. I think we have a panel here that will provide a very different set of perspectives from, from what we heard in the morning. In the morning, we heard primarily from the public sector, uh, different uh, participants in different uh, facets of the public sector, both in Asia and in, in North America. And now I think it's time that we hear some perspectives from, from the private sector. Uh, so with that, I would like to invite our panelists forward. Uh, first, we have Mr. Alexander Doyen, who's Regional Manager for Africa for Vestigard, uh, who bring a, a private sector uh, uh, perspective. Uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar, uh, CEO of the National Commodity and Derivatives Exchange Limited. Mr. Sanjeev uh, Astana, Managing Director of iFarms. And so we won't have exclusively private sector here. We have Mr. Uh, S.N. Jha, Assistant Director General, ICAR Division of Agricultural Engineering. Did we get iPhones? Okay, very good. Okay, so we, I have, uh, when we, well, when I received uh, the invitation to be a uh, panel chair, I failed to stipulate that I do not follow any panel chaired by Ashok. Uh, always runs a very exciting and dynamic and challenging panel. Uh, I also failed to stipulate that I shouldn't come right after lunch when everybody will be going to sleep. Uh, I then was told that we, uh, uh, we should organize this like a talk show. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what a talk show organization would be. Many of the talk shows, the panelists just shout at each other, and it's great fun, but nobody learns anything. So we'll see if we can we'll see if we can have some fun. There could be a little bit of shouting. Uh, no, please don't throw anything larger than a pen. And uh, we will. Uh, I hope with some lively discussion, get to bring out some additional issues and, and concerns. Uh, we do have a format that each uh, uh, panel member will have five minutes to, to speak, and then uh, that will sort of introduce their particular perspectives, and then from that we can build, uh, I think, a, a pretty dynamic and, and, and exciting conversation. 
So let me start with, uh, with Mr. Duane uh, from Vestergaard, and I think you probably have some opening remarks that you've already thought about. So please, the chair is yours. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, so I am working in uh, Nairobi with Vestergaard. Vestergaard is known uh, for the insecticide treated mosquito nets and um, in uh, the private sector we're known for the part of manufacturing which is which is called compounding so they uh, we invent um, you know we look at products and then we try to re-engineer which was the case with the, the mosquito net and that, that is called compounding so we're looking at resins and um, I will explain to you how that's uh, relevant for the uh, hermetic bag market I also want to have a quick word on uh, distribution. So, as um, uh, my colleague from the private sector mentioned in the morning session, that we from the beginning agreed that it's not a viable market uh, commercially. It's difficult, uh, the distribution uh, channel is lengthy to reach the people who need the technology the most in uh, rural areas. The price is expensive. If you take a very quick uh, economic analysis, if you're storing $10 worth of commodities and you're asking somebody to pay $2.5 uh, to store the commodities, that's, that's quite an easy decision uh, for the farmer. So we looked at the first uh, biggest perceived barrier in our opinion, which was the price. In the morning we saw some evidence, and I think there's been evidence over the last 20 years that uh, willingness to pay in price has been a big uh, barrier for adoption of this technology. So. We decided to look at the product and see how can we reduce uh, the cost, cost price. So we looked at the liner, uh, which is a very expensive uh, element in the bag. And we have uh, now taken a film-based approach. I have some, some film here. And um, we have taken the elements that are important in this liner, which is the gas barrier, and tried to, to reduce it. And then we have uh, now laminated, laminated this film on a, a woven bag. So, just long story short, this will reduce um, the, pr the plastic utilization by 70%, and if you compare it with a big spike, by up to 170%. So, a uh, good impact uh, for the environment, and more, most importantly, it will make it more affordable uh, for the farmers. The second thing we looked at is the distribution model. The traditional distribution model through the agrovates, which reaches uh, um, small-scale farmers, is expensive. It's a new product, and then by the time you reach them, you've been through, th through so many uh, elements of the supply chain, you know, from the wholesaler to the retailers. And then um, a study also has shown that in, in West Africa, people, farmers, if the bags were more than uh, seven kilometers away from where they lived, it was a technology that was not interesting for them. So how do we make this uh, more affordable in the distribution uh, channel? So there are examples of uh, receipt warehousing, which has been successful in India, as I understand, which is also tied with the uh, microfinance uh, services. In Africa, it's going to take a long time uh, for these uh, receipt warehousing systems to build. And a, a lot of people are uh, profiting from seasonality of uh, prices. So. We've decided to work with the microfinance organizations and with the mobile uh, mobile banking applications. So what's going to happen is that we're going to help some entrepreneurs at the community level to set up micro warehouses using these uh, affordable bags and they will then be storing uh, goods uh, for farmers in the community. We call this uh, program Chombo and through the mobile application when the um, warehouse managers, it's like a micro warehouse, sell the goods, some of the profit uh, from the price increase from the arbitrage will then be paid back uh, to the farmers through the application. So those are two examples of you know how we're trying to overcome the challenges uh, in this market with innovation to make uh, the bags more affordable to the farmers who need them the most. All right, thank you very, very much, uh, Alexander. Now, I, what I would like to do is, I would like to give the other two uh, members of the private sector 
a word and then circle back to the public sector to get the sort of uh, tie in with the uh, with the morning. So, uh, uh, Mr. Kumar from the National Commodities and uh, Derivatives Exchange Limited. I think we have a perfect segue there as he was talking about many warehouses and micro warehouses. So I think uh, uh, the first thing is uh, possibly what uh, makes sense for the individual farmer uh, may not make sense from an entire supply chain perspective. And I think just uh, when we started experiments in uh, trying to get farmers and link them to markets, uh, it so happened that each farmer didn't want his product mixed with someone else's because he thought his quality is better and uh, he wanted that number of bags to be kept uh, differently from uh, the other person. And, uh, and this lends itself to uh, virtually a high cost uh, and, uh, and difficult to monitor uh, sort of setup. And I think uh, progressively we have advocated reduction of cost all across the supply chain so that everyone benefits. And uh, for, the, for the large grains that we deal in, that means that you will have to have bulk uh, storage and bulk transportation. Uh, the current system, uh, which is really staggering for a, for a country like India to have 250 million tons in, in, um, in bags, is that it, the labor cost of just loading and unloading uh, at, the, at the Monday first and then in the warehouse and then at the plant uh, far exceeds the benefits, even if there were benefits of using bags. So I think uh, the direction, and as an exchange, one of the things, advantages we have is when we set the rules at the delivery centers that we have, and uh, therefore we can get away with uh, almost inflicting, I would say in this case, uh, the uh, transition from current habits uh, to then give benefits to all. So we hope that transition will happen. And what is surprising is that we have two contracts which are uh, crops of about 1 million tons, which, is, which are Castor and Varsi. And if you go to the seven odd processing plants in these, uh, in, for this, these crops, uh, which are in Gujarat and Rajasthan, none of the plants have any gully bag inside the plant. So the plant is fully silo and uh, automated movement, automated processing. And so, and the farmer grows in bulk. So why is it that everything outside is not stored in silo and not transported in bulk? So we're looking at it as a take one crop, at least a manageable crop in a manageable region. You have to transform everything together. Otherwise, the supply chain won't benefit. Even if you move it to bulk, and, and a lot of it is visible even in FCI. FCI holds it in bulk, moves it in bulk, and then again bags it and then ships it out. That may be okay for retail, but that's not necessary for processing plants. So I think uh, our focus is make sure the value chain is efficient and then everyone shares uh, the benefit. Okay, very good. That's a great open uh, remarks. Uh, Mr. Astana? Yeah, so... Uh, uh, the other part, of course. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, there are two parts to... Uh, and this whole issue around the storage, and I'm talking both from the past experiences and the current uh, sort of narrative around uh, you know the storage, and let's focus uh, entirely at the farm gate level as to really what the farmer uh, sort of the decision making process he has in terms of the kind of uh, bags he can use, whether they're viable or otherwise. So uh, one thing is very clear that uh, farmers, uh, as an economic decision maker, uh, is one of the very, is, he's very fine-tuned, he's got an exact understanding as to you know what makes sense for him and uh, what cost he needs to pay. So we have examples of farmers uh, you know, paying 30,000 rupees a kilo for uh, certain vegetable seeds, but uh, when it comes to negotiating for certain uh, you know, other costs, he's negotiating for even 5 rupees and 10 rupees. So clearly I think uh, uh, building up a narrative and a communication that you know economics-wise, that to the experiment uh, what was carried out uh, uh, in Bihar, I think that demonstrated success and if it's truly making sense for the farmer and I think uh, the question what uh, Ashok mentioned that uh, uh, you know is the communication good enough is that being a sort of narrative being built up that if you use this this will not make sense both in terms of the health and the economic benefits I think that is something which needs to be propagated at a much uh, uh, much more stronger level and I think that's a responsibility both at the policy side the private sector and the research I think they have to really build a strong case where the farmer sees that. 
But my submission, which I wanted to speak about, that uh, India has its own unique problems, like uh, most countries would have. That uh, why are we not looking at solution at only at the farmer level, but why are we not uh, evaluating options of uh, you know certain institutional mechanism by which uh, either through a public-private partnership or through set up of collectives like FPOs or uh, self-help groups or different uh, ways that truly you build up a viable form of storage which can be created at the farm gate level and uh, this will have spin-off benefits because we sort of spoke about this panel is all about the unintended consequences and the benefits what could accrue that uh, you could spur entrepreneurship so for example if the policy were to support the financial mechanisms were to support the ability of a collective of 200 farmers or 500 farmers or uh, 2000 farmers would certainly be able to invest in a sensible way in a storage system which does achieves all the objectives what we've been speaking about but without necessarily going through uh, the challenge of viability at a farm at a farmer level and i think that's a big issue what the country has and there's a demonstrated success we have seen in a whole lot of uh, uh, you know work and primarily the milk but i could talk at a pilot level in multiple uh, uh, you know areas like fruits and vegetables there's a lot of experiment getting carried out so rather than focusing on individual farmer look at a collective business model build up uh, you know a strong uh, platform then we look at funding them at that level and this could become spur the usage of uh, you know superior story systems etc at the farm gate level that's one my second uh, thesis is that uh, in terms of the benefit what really it does and i think this also is part of the national priority on agriculture itself that uh, you know in terms of spurring the uh, uh, you know the entrepreneurship at the at the farm gate level, uh, building up, uh, you know, creating job employment at the farm gate level, coming out with superior practices and the ability of you know, uh, genuinely having a managerial talent which can handle a grain storage at a at a uh, you know at, at that level, and then be able to participate in collateral management, warehousing receipt system, issues on uh, you know, futures, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, hedging their risk on uh, farmers, uh, you know, which can they can do effectively. That can be a phenomenal uh, benefit uh, it would look at. And uh, my other part is that in case, uh, uh, you know, once this will happen, the other spin off benefit I see is that once a viable lot size of grains in whatever form, whether it's maize or wheat or rice is available, you would see a very nascent and early stages of, uh, you know, investments around uh, food processing, very primary level of grading, processing, etc., which again through there are. Government is spending billions of dollars in funding through Mudra scheme. You know, there is a funding available to the small time entrepreneurs, which really can then be leveraged and then we can have a some bit of, uh, you know, what should I say, the convergence of a lot of these schemes, where they can get together in terms of building up this entire piece around storage with the benefits of employment, entrepreneurship, some bit of processing, which itself is a great uh, preventer of uh, losses which could occur. And uh, I think for that, the key requirement is, uh, you know, getting the technology right getting the uh, the uh, business model right. I think that's really the key part of it, the, you know, the cost benefit analysis and truly that is working on the ground level where farmers not only witness and see that, building up managerial capacity for small entrepreneurs who can take it forward and then drive it, really scale it up at a big way in states like Bihar and UP and Jharkhand and uh, Northeast and you will immediately uh, see the kind of progress what we can see, otherwise this will may take decades for any really substantial change to occur at the ground level. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, to round out our opening remarks, Dr. S. N. Jha, please. Thank you very much. My half job previous to Mr. Jack Martin, since he was done, I have already done. I have only told the things. And uh, I actually am very happy that uh, the help of Italy, the idea of my doing this job here. First time it really has been. Uh, Activity of the Southwest of engineering activity. It's a very good thing. Many people uh, speak about the post harvest losses and uh, many levels. But uh, then, yeah, I personally, I was the involved as a principal investigator of last study which we did we under the age of the All India Coordinated Research Project on post engineering technology of ICR at CFET Udiyana, that is Central Institute of Postal Engineering. Most of the pictures, as I, I have previous morning also I have seen, the people just show the picture, which is the worst, maybe out of thousand one picture, maybe that, which is the baddest, out of bad, the worst picture they show. 
that he actually not have out of thousand thousand uh, go downs. If somewhere one is rotting, you are just portraying that your storage loss is this. But that is not true. Out of, out of thousand uh, storage structure may one have mismanagement or maybe some other other reason. Similarly, I have heard more that many people here in India just live on 1.5 dollar per day. Means portraying like that that we are an Indian are so poor in 1.5 dollar. But friends, in 1.5 dollar, that is more than 100 rupees. They can have full day three, four meals, but in America, one point five dollar nothing. So this comparison is very bad. Uh, it is better that we show the best things and tell the people to follow the best. A lot of changes have happened in India also. We have already around 75 million ton storage, go down the storage at the government, our FCI, our CWC, uh, in form of go downs, and also around 12 million tons under cap that is covered and built. The storage you say that, that is not good, that is temporary the storage structures. And then when the storage go down our back end, then we transfer that. And the government of India is slowly moving towards the side of the storage, that is being storage, whatever mechanized storage. And almost around 12 million tons. I do not I am not confirmed that this data is in the next about 12 million tons. Silo storage is already there in India with the FCI and other agencies. And we have around 12 to 15 million tons in the pipeline that is, that is being done. So, a lot of improvement uh, are being put in place. So, silo storage, Government India policy there, if you might have heard the last budget also, government has given that article we had 10, 10 years back and our policy. And government has now accepted that the storage structures should be at block level, you might have heard. So instead of centralized storage, if the agency in all at block level or at least at district level, they should have the storage yard or grain. Or we, I personally say that grain, grain banks. You procure all the grain from the farmer, then do all the primary processing. Here you see, most of the farmer does, does not want to do primary processing. Why selling them? or worst enemy for the story. So those drying are not being done. So establish a village level or block level or maybe at panchayat level or at the most at the this level. Um, and then you can actually help the farmer. So that is the thing required. Bulk storage, the policy, bag storage, I have seen your bag, whatever you have seen that you must see the Bag characteristics. Bag can store a bag must have some fixed ones. You see, farmer cannot store only one bag. Farmer will require 10 bag, 100 bag, 20 bag, and they have to stack. The stacking is required, but your bag cannot be stacked. It will just sleep. So what is the coefficient of friction of your storage bag? That that is a must. Then also here most of the time handling is required. Handling means hook. Most of the go down and use the hooks. Booking. So your plastic bag will not be there. <coughs> and of course, fumigation is required. You are not, you are 100% silent on fumigation. Fumigation, most of them first been our friend Dr. Arkesing from Sibiru or some, something on fumigation. But we are also searching on bio based fumigation system has to be whatever you are bag, bag storage, plain storage, in silo or in go down, that fumigation required to be done. And, uh, Loss study methodology, our methodology has been now adopted by the FAO also, so there is no questions. Nowhere in the world, friends, 30% is the loss of the food. Food is different. There are two terms, food loss, food waste. Food waste is you go in party, don't eat, throw. That is a food waste. And food loss, that is from harvest to till the water, water in the channel, different channel you are crossing, that is physical loss. And food loss I personally also consider when you eat one kilo but you require only 500 gram to eat. You are eating more, you are eating other share. So that is also a stage of food. So that is very difficult to assess. So, and methodology, and I also say that most of the people we are only interested in numbers, that 2%, 6%, 10%, but each and people are looking at itself. You can, I request all of you kindly go through that report. If you know not available, you can go to snjar.in, www.snjar.in. 
See each and every 46 commodities we have handled, and each and every commodity loss reasons and remedies required are written there. Even the losses are because of the only farmer is having weak thresher, they are using for that is for pulse thresher also. Pulse threshing of pulse also. So essence are not in, you go and read the whole thesis of the report. Each and every 46 commodity has been dipped and then attack those regions to reduce the loss. Simply a storage will not do. A storage loss is only 1%, 2%, 3% if you go through that. Okay, thank you very much. I think I think we have four, at least I find, four very stimulating interventions that uh, can lead us down many different uh, many different paths. And uh, I I have some comments. I, I'm, I'm going to try to hold them until the end. Even though I'm sort of itching to make them, I will will hold my hold my tongue. Uh, some of the questions that we were asked to look at or, or around uh, unintended consequences, barriers to adoption, et cetera. And the <coughs> session here says improved storage systems. It doesn't say hermetic bags, okay? So let's, let's I think we're, we're finding ourselves as a group converging on hermetic bags where I'm not necessarily convinced that all of us think that that is the, the ultimate solution. But we can fight about that in a minute. One question I have, just to, to, to get us going here, is on how to deal with fraud and unethical behavior. Uh, just a little story I had. We had a, the CEO and top managers of a very, very prestigious Indian ag company visit us at Erie. They heard about the hermetic bags. They came back to India and manufactured 100,000 bags uh, now, we'll leave intellectual property issues aside there. <coughs> Manufactured 100,000 bags, sold them, and they came complaining and said none of them worked. That these farmers suffered. Now, there's probably nothing easier to counterfeit than a hermetic bag. So from a, maybe, uh, maybe uh, uh, Vestergaard uh, has some ideas or experience on that. So Alexander, do you have any thoughts on if we are in the domain of uh, hermetic bags, how do we deal with fraud, counterfeit, not just the, the negative impact that has on the farmer, but the impact it has on the reputation of the technology where it might be used? Um, yeah, it's a tough question um, because it's a novel um, product, you know? so. It doesn't have any brand equity. The brand is not known, uh, not even the concept, you know, so we're starting from scratch. So I think the first thing that can be done is uh, to create some standards so that um, bags can easily be tested at the country level. One of the challenges with hermetic bags is the uh, what's called the uh, OTR, oxygen transmission rate uh, testing, because it requires some very expensive uh, equipment, you know, which I think is the equivalent of uh, $80,000 US. So most countries don't have this, so they self-contract uh, in different countries. So if a, a clear standard was created, and that's the case now, uh, the, um, I, the East Africa Grain uh, Council, which happens to be in Nairobi, has created a global standard for hermetic bags. So now at the policy level, government, Ministry of Agriculture has to, to make sure that these standards are quickly adopted and so that's a way that you can test uh, quality. The other thing is branding, um, you know, the private sector then has to go and um, make the, the effort to, to create some clear branding uh, so that just like with other products, farmers who can, can know which can recognize and, and value uh, some of the brands uh, on the market. Apart from that, as I said, it, it's testing oxygen transmission rates is, is quite uh, scientific, you know, so it, it is still uh, something difficult to implement. Yeah, please. Uh, government of India, I must be going on with more. We have the FSS Airport Safety and Standard of India of India since 2006. FSS Airport Safety of Standards of India of India are there. And we have all the standards and very stringent standards. Sometimes even better than the international standards. 
And personally, I come with the help of ICAR, we have established around 40 food testing labs throughout the India. And the Ministry of Food Processing is giving the funds and maybe around 100 food testing labs throughout India had already come up. Some of them are accredited by NABM or some are in the process. So those things are already there and this oxygen vapor barriers, testing and other things are not so sensitive. Very cheap instruments are coming. We have many instruments. Then anyone can go there and you just pay a nominal amount. You need more than dollar to do it. You can go and get it tested. No problem. Most of the issues are, for example, in the nearby, in the investment is not full. Um, in the Sonika near Delhi, in Ludhiana, you are showing for a little bit. Many food issues are having those kind of issues. Plus, the, I have told in the beginning, a lot of changes have occurred. Occurred and many questions are there. There is no problem at all. Yeah, I think uh, obviously you need to. Uh, get the veracity of the process and the materials uh, established and uh, it's possibly better done by professionals uh, as a group, either on behalf of groups of members or for the government itself. I think uh, there's, uh, and, and it needs to be appropriate to your country. So for example, we uh, recently taken delegations to Australia to look at uh, what a tropical environment uses uh, and um, in various sizes in terms of all farm, farm storage. And I think uh, the model that India has done for milk uh, maybe is that you have to get it right all the way so that uh, the farmer benefits, but not because the farmer himself needs to invest something. It's someone else that needs to connect uh, all the parts so that the farmer benefits. But the investment need not necessarily come from him. It can come from a board, it can come from a FPO, as we've classified it. So now, for instance, as uh, was pointed out, this, uh, there are two or three policy issues. So one of the things is about intended consequences. Historically, we've associated storage with hoarding. And when you are using so much of food grains that you can't, I mean, you're exceeding demand, you should change that stance. And you should then say storage is a valuable uh, a service rendered to the farmer or the intermediaries. And so recognize that as a positive. If the government stores 70 million tons, that's not hoarding. But if the private sector stores it, and someday you turn around and say it's hoarding, that's why the private sector isn't investing in silos. That's one. And second, of course, is land is so difficult to get in India that maybe the farmer producer organization is the way to go. That the government can create the asset on and owned by the farmer. So the asset is owned by the farmer and he earns rent on that asset. Today, the grain that FCI stores in silos, the rent is paid to some industrialist who's got a silo. So maybe the switch will be that, as was said, uh, localize the investment get the best investment uh, in terms of quality, as you said, uh, the best processes for uh, storage established at a local level. And I think what it will also do is it will enable jobs to be created. And it's not everyone, half the population can't survive on farming. So if you create this sort of infrastructure, then we, uh, uh, at the village or, or uh, a group of village level, uh, young students learning how to handle conveyors or handle fumigation equipment, etc. We can then all go on to technical uh, jobs. So there may be other multiplier effect benefits of, of something. Yeah, I think that, uh, that, that's a very good uh, uh, yeah, uh, quick, uh, this one. So I think that's a, the fraud is a real issue. So in any, there are multiple cases of you know wrong kind of seeds going to the market, complaints going so far corporate to be investing in this and a fake counterfeit bags which you know which otherwise cost one and a half dollars he's selling it for 15 rupees so that's a real issue and that's why I'm saying that the whole direction of this discourse cannot be at individual farmer level but the able the same bags can yet be used by a collective which is then has the capacity to negotiate better to manage the quality better to be able to evaluate uh, in, a, in a better way that is the direction to go and I think that might give us better results Rather than focusing on small individual farmer becoming the core of this one, we could expect we could do the run the pilot on that to really come out with empirical findings as to what makes sense. But really, the unit what you have to target is that collectives of either farmers or small entrepreneurs who are then connected at a broader level with the national grid or whatever can get created. 
but building a good business model around which is viable, which is sensible, which can sustain itself, not on subsidies, not on perpetual subsidy and support, but can last over the long term, I think that is a solution to the storage uh, part of it. I think these are very, very, very interesting interventions because we are seeing a sense emerge that we're talking about really transforming a pretty significant portion of our food system and uh, the post-harvest, if you would, post-harvest pre-consumption. That's a complex, uh, complex chain. And I think this is something that, that we've seen. We talk about post-harvest losses and so many of us, myself included, tend to think of a, bu of, of a bunch of rice or, or maize sitting in a bin with a few we weevils uh, begetting more weevils and more weevils and then you lose your crop. In actual fact, the post-harvest losses can occur all the way down uh, or up, up the chain, if, if you would. And uh, along with this idea of the, of the whole chain, and maybe not just looking only at individual farmers who can buy five bags. I would like to ask the question, who are the losers? Let's say we're wildly successful. Let's say that we transform the situation so that our, our post-harvest losses go from 30%, which I actually don't believe at all. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna just say parenthetically, I'm a plant pathologist we would talk about the losses to our favorite disease. It would be 2%, 5%. Then the entomologist would talk about the losses. And it seemed to me that when we add up all the losses, the earth is starved to death because there's no food, okay? But that's my own particular little bias. But let's assume that we're wildly successful and we bring our post-harvest losses down to 1 or 2%. And, um, <clears throat> Who are going to be the losers? I mean, if, is this a situation where everybody wins or is there going to be a loser? Now, my experience in life is that there's always some kind of loser and that in a, situ in, in, in a, in a sector of the commodity of, of our economy that's so large, the losers are going to be large and powerful and not going to want to be losers. So. Am I overly cynical by saying that there's got to be a loser somewhere <coughs> if we're successful? Dr. Uh, Astana, you have your, your hand up there. So it doesn't have to be win-lose always. But uh, the problem in India is not about the commercial part of it, neither the part of in terms of who gains and who shares the losses. It's really the issue of in terms of how the regulations are managed at the ground level. And that is where the problem is that uh, you know the small time government officer who's there, the small entrepreneurs, he starts exploiting the farmers and misuses the rules. So even you may lay down the best of rules that how the collectives get managed. But typically the challenge always is that uh, how the rules are implemented at the ground level. And that's where we find the best of, uh, with the best of intent, uh, the well-drafted rules with strong regulations typically just don't get implemented. But having said that, I think the possibility of having very large scale losers or having some vested interest trying to stymie it or you know really something going dramatically wrong uh, far is far far lesser but the benefits will far outweigh any potential losers small time they may be but that winds of change are already happening and i, I repeat again that i think if our, our uh, communication our uh, if it's right if it's appropriate if that we can feel convinced about it we have demonstrated that at 100 locations 5000 locations that works well you will find that this will catch like wildfire and uh, you know whether it was adoption of uh, you know BT Carter in India, whether it was adoption success of uh, you know dairy cooperatives, whether it's successful of uh, intervention at the uh, you know horticulture in whole lot of areas where we've demonstrated benefit on a sustainable basis is is available. It tends to be more successful and can be scaled up, and you will find that there are not too many losers because in this case it's not that uh, somebody has to lose for somebody to win. Any other yeah, should we? Very comfortable, but loser in the country or the world. Nature is the loser. I am telling one story. I asked one, one businessman doing business on the tomato. He was buying 50 pesos per kilo. 50 pesos per kilo of tomato from farmers. And he was transporting the tomato in the truck just like anything. And when I 
I don't know why you are bringing tomato like this. You should bring it in the crates. But the when we use the crate, then the capacity of that truck will be very less. So he is not interested in that. He told that whatever I will bring from Haryana, everything will be sold in the Alar Mandi. I will buy one rupee, I will buy in ten rupees. I will sell, sell it in ten rupees. So I am not in loss. Farmer is getting there, farmer is not in loss. For the finally, we will lose a lot of all systems. Systems because whatever tomato were compressed in the truck, that is rotten and that will be thrown on the road. So, system of nature, that's soil, water, and we all are losers. So, people should be more and more wild on the ground. Why in the future? Okay, I've got a sign here that said we have five minutes and we're supposed to wrap up. I want to ask our panelists if you have any points that you really would like to share before I kind of wrap up a little bit. Uh, Alexander, please. So, since I'm sitting in the research uh, institute and most of the people attending this meeting are from research uh, institutes, I want to discuss about a barrier that, I mean, um, uh, that I've been challenged with uh, in the field. It's in the regulatory uh, issues. You know, when I do product registration, we have tried to bring um, an innovative product to the market to, for the benefit of farmers. I don't know if that's the case in India. I'm discussing about the case in Africa, but I have uh, one of the bags we do has uh, insecticide treatment, so it's a novelty. And so when I try to register it, even though it's been evaluated by FAO, and we have many, many uh, publications which have shown the safety and the efficacy of the bag, whenever I need to register it, the local research institutes uh, want to do some local testing. And so right now, for example, I got an email from uh, Malawi where I want to work with USA. They're asking me to uh, register the bag with the local institute. And so I just got an email and he's saying, okay, let's, we're going to write the, um, the proposal for this. Let's meet in se September 2020 to look at the proposal, not even to start the field studies. So this is a big barrier and I wish that um, Maybe it's naive of me, but I wish that the research institutes could uh, discuss with the local uh, research institutes. You know, and I think we can recognize today that there are some experts in uh, uh, mycotoxins, aflatoxin issues, also in hermetic bugs, and I wish they could take the lead and discuss with these um, uh, local research institutes so that we don't waste so much time uh, to get these technologies in the hands of farmers. Very, very briefly. Uh, in the ICR, we have around 111 issues of almost all the commodities and also engineering and post harvest. And we have also many, 65 around the India community research projects. One, post, one is totally on the post harvest engineering and technology. So, any kind of research, any kind of testing on a sponsor basis, we are open to. If you want to do, you can reach to ICR. I am personally responsible for the post harvest of ICR. You can write to me and then I will direct you to a particular institute. And then, then you have to do that. Friends, we don't have, we have a lot of technology. All only thing that we have to bring the awareness, demonstration, testing, and people should adopt and automatically then cross. And the government of India also bringing, likely to come full processing policy. Ministry of Food Processing has already drafted the food processing policy, so things will be more clear after some time. Okay, well, I don't know about you, but I felt that we were just getting started. I think we could have gone on for the entire afternoon, and it would have only gotten more interesting. At least, I mean, I thought you guys were making some very, very good points, and I was uh, quite enthralled. But what it, it struck me that uh, the, the opening remarks and then the subsequent dis, uh, discussion, and I might be overreacting here, but I, I, I had the sense that from the comment before lunch and then opening remark from, from Mr. Doyen is that, uh, well, actually the bags is a, is a really viable business model. I mean, you'll say that, but then we, we're not going to say it too loud. And then subsequent discussions that follow on from that or a logical 
extension from that is we need to rethink our whole storage process and that uh, and how we handle our stores, uh, uh, you know, handling them in bags as we do in India and, else and elsewhere is grossly inefficient. And that uh, we need to be thinking about how we, and this is not rocket science, to redo, rehandle how we store our, our principal foods. And uh, I, 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 and then it's a small step from there, I think, to how you can actually have your farmer gain value from that. And I'm just delighted to see the Commodities Exchange moving into these areas because I think that's the way a farmer could forward sell his or her harvest before they even plant it. Then they've got that cash, which is the biggest uh, binding of their, of their opportunities. And so I think that, you know, we're seeing an almost a convergence of thinking about, well, let's rethink how we store our crops in developing countries. And the idea of every farmer buying 10 bags and let's hope they last three seasons because then they'll get a good return despite that they've got a hook that they're hauling that bag around with because it is 50 kilos. Um, maybe let's rethink this stuff. And, uh, and, and, I, and I'm reminded being an old guy that I am retired that generals are always fighting the last war. And so here we're fighting the, the bag war. When in fact we should be looking to a, a semi-controlled climate warehouse war. And how that could be put in and how farmers can benefit from that. And then where does post-harvest uh, storage and management fit into that context? Because as we know, the food economy is really changing. And I, I worry that if we work in our mindset and are putting our energy to make sure we have the best 50 kg bag, we're going to have that bag and nobody's going to want it. And not, not that I'm exposing a bias here. But I, I do think, uh, I think that's with some of the ideas that were circulating here. And I saw too many heads nodding up and down to think that I'm the only one thinking like that. But having said that, Again, let me come circle back to what I, I mentioned earlier. The post -har management of our post-harvest conditions and the, the various steps in the uh, from harvest to consumption chain doesn't just mean storage losses, and it just doesn't mean storage losses in bags. So let's not let ourselves get boxed in to some narrow thinking at the outset here. Okay, I want to thank. Uh, the panel, I think they just did a great job. I, I regret that uh, that we wouldn't, we couldn't go on all afternoon. But I do have to mention to to, to SN Jha that I don't know what newspapers he reads, but I've never read a newspaper that publishes good news. So, <laughs> so, so you're not alone in feeling that people only publish bad news. Okay. So with that, I would like to ask the invite the audience to thank the panelists. Thank you so much.